Be seated, turn to Psalm 33, the verse that uh, Willard uh, read to us earlier. We're going to start with that this morning and uh, preach from that particular chapter. Psalm 33, if you would, Psalm 33, verse number 12. Would you all like to hear a COVID joke? Never mind, there's a 99.96 chance you won't get it, so forget it. All right, somebody will maybe get that later on. I don't know. We'll see. All right. I don't know about y'all, but I am sick and tired of the America haters. Sick and tired of it. And uh, we have uh, raised a whole generation, it seems like, who hate America. And it's very sad. And uh, listen, uh, all we hear about is the injustices. But let me tell you something. There is plenty of good things about America and plenty of great things about America. Now, is America perfect? No. Uh, we uh, have a new group they call, they're called progressives. Well, they're, they're progressing the wrong direction. And uh, they're, they're backing up everything. They're turning everything upside down. And uh, evil is called good and good is called evil. And uh, we're, we're in that mode. I mean, it's, and it's been that way for a long time, but it's getting worse by the day. There's plenty of good things about America. Plenty of good things about our history. One of the things that uh, uh, is very sad is that a lot of times people do not respect other people's property. And, uh, boy, we, we need to teach our kids to respect other people's property and to leave it alone. And if you want something, guess what? Get a job. Go get it yourself and keep it for yourself. I'm sick and tired of people saying the cops need more training. Let me tell you something. Uh, The kids need more training. Young adults should already have that training to leave everybody else's stuff alone. That burning and looting and carrying on, rioting is not right. It's not right. Uh, we had, uh, uh, you know, parents, you got 18 years, 18 years to teach your kids to do right. And boy, we've got a lot of parents who blew it. A lot of parents have blown it big time. And, um, you know, the kids, again, need to learn that it's wrong to loot and steal and set buildings ablaze and block traffic and laser people's eyes and overturn cars and destroy buildings and attack citizens. <laughs> Teach your kids. I, uh, I've never had to go grab one of my kids out of one of those things. But if my kids were down there in the middle of all that, I'd go down there and grab them by the ear and drag them all the way home. I said, what in the world is wrong with you? So America's not perfect. We got problems. But I got news for you. America's great. And America's good. And if you study history, you understand that. The Bible says in Psalm 33, 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. And this is our America. And I, I, I always enjoy celebrating this day and around this day on the Sunday around the July the 4th when we can uh, do uh, these America songs and we can do these pledges and, and we can highlight our flag and highlight our nation. Because I'm thankful to be an American this morning. I didn't, I didn't get to choose. I, I, last week, you know, I preached a message. I didn't get to choose when I was born, to who I was born to, and where I was born. But I'm thankful that I was born where I was born and to whom I was born. And I'm very thankful for that. As you look at our nation, and many of you have traveled different places and seen different things. I've traveled over a good bit of it. Uh, uh, some have traveled even more extensively. But we have a wonderful, wonderful nation. From ocean to ocean, a land of charm, a land of of beauty and grandeur. You know, a lot of people want to travel overseas. Nothing wrong with that, traveling overseas to see things. But you you can spend your whole life just seeing things here in America. And and the beauty of America. Uh, 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 People that live on the ocean, what do they like to do? Go to mountains. People who live in the mountains, you know what they like to do? Go to ocean. And uh, we live right here by it. But it's, it's, it's marvelous to see, and, it's, and it is marvelous to go out to that ocean out there and to look out there, and I mean the vastness of that is amazing. To go to the mountains and see the vastness 
uh, of that, to go to the, the middle of, the, of, of our country and just see the, the, the prairies out there. I mean, just straight, solid uh, land, and it just goes on and on and on. Uh, you ever go to some of those places and, and you just see cornfields? And I mean, for miles, you can just see cornfields. And it's amazing uh, 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 to see. And of course, you see that around here and all of the things that we see. You see up on the board up here a slide from George Washington praying at Valley Forge. And many of you know that story. If you don't know that story, it's very sad if you don't. But of course, Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, that terrible winter of 1777, when the Revolutionary Army faced inevitable defeat. And in that very tragic and awesome hour, George Washington knelt in prayer for God's preserving grace upon our new nation. The next slide will tell you about the Continental Congress. Ten years later, 55 brave men assembled in Independence Hall in Philadelphia, there to write the Constitution of our country. On the desk of the presiding officer was one book. You know what that book was? It was this right here. It was a Bible. A British visitor one time asked a friend, which one is George Washington? And the reply came back, when Congress goes to prayer, the one that kneels is George Washington. The Constitution, of course, that they wrote is one of the greatest documents of liberty and freedom outside of the Word of God to be found in political history, the history of the world. You know, it was then, of course, that our founding fathers looked upward to heaven and, and they found in, in the Word of God and in the character of God uh, the safeguard for rights and liberties of, of man, the bulwark against oppression. And they wrote, of course, it is by the creation of God that we before him and before the laws of justice are free and equal. Those men looked to heaven. That's what made them different. They looked to heaven. Now we have, you know, we still have prayer in our Congress. But then they get to the end and they say, amen and a woman. And I say, God help us. Those prayers bounce off the roof of that place, I can tell you. But the prayers that these men prayed did not. They got to the ears of God himself. And if you know the history, you know the Constitutional Convention was deadlocked. Those 13 colonies that met up there. Days and weeks of futile debate. And then Ben Franklin stood up and he said that we cannot hope to succeed except in the blessing of Almighty God. And so they went to the Lord in prayer. And thereafter, each session was opened by prayer. Now, here's a bit of history on the next slide that some of you may know, some of you may not know. But uh, during the Civil War, of course, the North, uh, the United States Army, eventually won. And at the end, it was time for the Confederate Army uh, to surrender. And so President Lincoln left Washington, D.C. And uh, he went to Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy. He did not ride in as a warrior or as a conqueror. He walked. He walked into the city. Think about that. President Lincoln walked into the city as a plain citizen, in essence, and walked down the streets of Richmond, Virginia. Now, somebody could have shot him right then. From any window, they could have done that. He was in the South, in essence. He was in the Confederacy. But he made his way to the State House and into the office of the President of the Confederacy. He uh, uh, seated at the desk of Jefferson Davis. President Abraham Lincoln bowed his head in prayer for the healing of the nation. He never lived to see that prayer answered. But of course, the southern states are now just as much a part of the United States as any other. The next slide will remind you about D-Day. And again, we don't uh, know enough about history in our world today. But D-Day. W.A. Criswell, great preacher from yesteryear. 
He tells the story this way. He says, one of the uh, poignant memories of my life is in recalling D-Day in our last world war. He said, word was sent out that when the message comes that our American men have stormed the very fortress of Hitler in continental Europe, that immediately all of us would gather in our churches asking God's blessing upon that tremendous and significant effort. Imagine that. He said, I was pastor then in 1940 in Muskogee, Oklahoma, and the word came in about 2 o'clock in the morning. The word came that the men had landed on the beaches of Normandy. And he says, immediately I arose and dressed and made my way down to the church for prayer and the blessing of God upon our men. 2 o'clock in the morning. This is what he found right here. You see the next slide. He said, when I walked into that church, I could not believe my eyes. The church was filled. It was jammed with people who were there to pray for the soldiers of the United States and others who were trying to win a victory over Hitler. The next slide tells us, of course, that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And can you imagine what life would be like today if Hitler had won the Second World War? Of course, we would be speaking German. They would have taken over. And that's what they wanted, of course. They wanted to take over the world. Um, Did you know that in Germany he imprisoned the pastors? And um, he placed in prison camps those who called upon the name of the Lord. And that, of course, that was not all. He took the Jewish people, of course, and imprisoned them and killed five or six million of them, amongst other things. And we would not be here today if God had not answered the prayers of those people in those churches or in the situation that we're in. The Bible says, except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. And I'll tell you this much. It's been the choice of Almighty God up until this time to bless America. But as we look around, you have to believe that His hand is... Not on America as strong as it was. And eventually his hand will be off America if things do not change. The next slide will remind you of a story in the Bible from 2 Kings. About a man named Sennacherib. Sennacherib. Sennacherib was one of the great warriors of history. He was the uh, king of Assyria. When Assyria was the world dominant power. And Sennacherib was a brutal man. He was a ruthless man. He was a terrible adversary. He did not care anything about you or anybody else. All he wanted to do was conquer the world. Now he was a very gifted soldier. And they had conquered again most of the world. But then he comes to the city of of God. He comes to the city of Jerusalem. And you can read this again in 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19 later on. But he comes and he sends a letter. He he surrounds the city. Of course, the city has walls and he surrounds the city uh, with thousands upon thousands of soldiers. Jerusalem's really a small place. It's really not all that big. And he surrounds the city. And he sends a letter to Hezekiah, the king. And he tells Hezekiah that your God is worthless to you. Don't even think about talking to your God about this because he is worthless to you. Your God cannot help you. We're out here and we're getting ready to take this city. I demand complete capitulation. I I demand uh, uh, that you give complete surrender. And we're going to take over and we're going to put all of the people in Jerusalem that that will not fight against us. If they fight, they're going to kill you. If you don't fight, we're going to take you into slavery and we're going to destroy the city. That's what Sennacherib told Hezekiah. Now, if you know about the kings, you know that Hezekiah was one of the good kings, one of the godly kings. So you know what Hezekiah does? He went to the house of the Lord. And he laid out that letter before the Lord. 
And while he was on his knees before God Almighty, the prophet Isaiah, who had been sent by God to talk to Hezekiah, came into the temple and he said, King Hezekiah, you don't have anything to worry about. The battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. The battle is not yours. It is the Lord's. And so you see on the picture over here to the left, God sent one angel. One angel that night. And the next morning when Sennacherib woke up, God allowed him to wake up. When Sennacherib woke up, he looked out there and 185,000 men had died during the night because of the death angel of God. Sennacherib went back to Nineveh. When he got back to Nineveh, you know what happened to him? Two of his sons rose up against him and killed him. Sennacherib, the great man. But let me tell you, let me remind you of something. God's in control. God's in control. The next slide. Maybe you recognize the history behind it or not. I don't know. In 1588, King Philip of Spain gathered the most invincible armada of ships the world to that time had ever seen. And he sent them to destroy England. We call that, of course, the Spanish Armada. Some of you studied that. And if you haven't, it's sad that you did. Well, the Lord did not want England to be destroyed by the Spanish Armada. So you know what the Lord did? He called one of his servants. It wasn't an angel this time. It was, does anybody know? The wind. The wind. He controls the wind too. And he sent such a boisterous wind that all of those ships ended up uh, 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 blowing up on the rocks and being destroyed. God told the winds, he said, you see those ships right down there? Go down there and destroy them. Blow them up on the rocks. And that's exactly what the wind did. The Spanish Armada, destroyed by the hand of God. You may notice the next slide. I'm showing you God at work in history. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. A great military genius of France by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte. They, uh, by the way, they still study uh, Napoleon today. For military maneuvers and things. He was a genius. But you've heard the story of Napoleon at Waterloo. He again had come to destroy the English army. God did not want the English army to be destroyed at that time. And so when the battle was joined, Napoleon was not aware that before him was a sunken road. And so when he gave the order for his cavalry to charge, those horses coming to that sunken road unaware, uncharted, unknown, fell into the ditch, into that road. The horses uh, stumbled on them, uh, on the men. Uh, a great surging throng back stumbled over them. And the whole effort of Napoleon lay prostrate there in an indescribable heap of men and soldiers. Nobody would have ever Guess that in a million years, what took place. But that's God. I have to ask this question. Why, next slide, why, uh, why didn't Germany invent the atomic bomb? That's not an atomic bomb there. But why, why did Germany not invent the atomic bomb? Do you know that, that uh, they were very close to doing that? Do you know that? If you studied history, you know that Germany was very close to having the atomic bomb. Matter of fact, uh, if, if, again, if you, if you know uh, history, you understand that in Germany at that time, they had the greatest scientists, the greatest universities, the smartest people in the world, in essence, were there. Matter of fact, what you see up there is called a V weapon. A V weapon. And they uh, came up with that V weapon uh, in their laboratories, of course. 
And that was the weapon that they kept shooting at England over and over and over. Can you imagine thousands of those coming at you? And what would happen? And of course, Churchill said, we're just not going to give up. We're just not going to give up. But why is it that Germany did not first discover the atomic bomb? Because of God. God held it back, gave it to America. And of course, that was the thing, as you see in the next slide, that we used to finish off World War II. That ended it. That ended it. There was not going to be any more fighting after those two bombs, those two atomic bombs were dropped on Japan. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The next slide will remind you that there were conquistadors who came from Spain. What did they come over here for? Well, for a four-letter word. Starts with a G, ends with a D. O-L, G-O-L-D, gold. That's why they came over here. But then the next slide is going to tell you another group of people who came over here to this country. The Puritans, the pilgrims, they came over here for a three-letter word that is very similar to the four-letter word that the conquistadors came. We're just going to drop the L out of that four-letter word, and what are we going to have? G-O-D. So the conquistadors came for gold, the Puritans, the pilgrims, and those people came for God. And what a difference that made. So what makes a nation great? Is it because of the territory that that nation has? Well, if, if that's the case, then Russia would be the greatest nation on earth because of their vastness. And it is vast. If uh, resources make a nation great, of course, the United States has a lot of resources, but, but really so does Brazil. And Brazil might be the greatest nation on the face of the earth. If, a, if just population makes a nation great, then of course China and India, over a billion people live in each of those two places. One third of the population of the world, it lives in those two places. Well, that would make, it, that would make them the greatest nations on earth. If an ancient civilization made a nation great, then China would be the greatest nation. But a nation is not made great by its land, but by the men who till them. Not by its vast forests, but by the men who use them. Not by its rich mines, but the men who work them. Not, not by its vast transportation system, but the men who built them. Lyman Abbott said this, America was a great land when, when Columbus discovered it. Americans have made of it a great nation. Henry Grady was speaking of the greatness of America. And he said, I stood by the Hampton Roads in Chesapeake Bay uh, and, and saw there the great naval strength of America. And then on the shore, the parading might of our armies. And he says, as I looked at the army and I looked at the navy, I said, surely the strength of America is to be found in, the, uh, in its military and naval might. And we can go there, thank you. Now, and then uh, he said, uh, he went to cap the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. And, of course, this was a long time ago. And he said, surely the greatness of America is, is to be found in its Senate, its Congress, and its legislative processes. Then he said, sometime later I was a guest in a home in Georgia on a farm of an old friend that I knew from boyhood days. And he said, this family loved God. This family loved God's Word. This family loved prayer. This family loved to go to church. And the great orator, Henry Grady, said, There came to my heart the conviction that the strength of America is found in its godly people. And I'll tell you right now, that is still true today. What is the true might and strength of America? It is, it's godly people. Mark Levin, you'll see uh, this quote up here. Mark Levin, you may have heard of him. He said, faith is not a threat to civil society. But you know, a lot of people see it as a threat. But it's not a threat. But rather vital to its survival. 
You want to get rid of all the churches and the Christians? This country will go to pot. He goes on to say it encourages, talking about faith, encourages the individual to personally adhere to a dogma that promotes restraint, duty, and moral behavior, which not only benefit the individual, but the multitudes and society generally. The next slide again reminds us, of course, the psalmist says that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And we've seen it in the histories of America. We've seen it in the histories of Great Britain. And both of our nations were ruled by a series of men who, again, while not perfect, at least acknowledged God and declared their dependence upon Him. It's very sad to see England. They basically declared their independence from God now. Used to be churches on every street corner in England. Not anymore. Very, very rare. And, of course, even here in America. We've abandoned God. We've kicked God out of a whole lot of things. And you know what? God has abandoned us to our choices. He has given us over to a reprobate mind. A mind that can think of things and does things that you can't even imagine. And of course you wouldn't even have imagined 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 50 years ago going on in our country today. Isaiah 29, 15, you see it on the board, says this, Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord. And their works are in the dark, and they say, Who seeth us, and who knoweth us? Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For uh, shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not, or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? In other words, uh, the people in our world today have acted like God doesn't exist, that we made our own selves. But of course, Psalms 100 tells us it is God that made it and not we ourselves. And we can do anything we want to do because there is no God. Listen. Go to the next slide. And so knowing and living by the will of God is a good pattern for living. It's a recipe for blessing. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the person whose God is the Lord. If we want to reject God's will, we want to go against His plan, it is a recipe for judgment and spiritual disaster. Listen, our nation cannot survive if it lives in drunkenness. During the pandemic, we learned a lot, didn't we? Liquor stores essential churches non-essential now if that doesn't tell you a lot about what's going on in our world today and how sad it is see america cannot live in drunkenness we cannot live in debauchery we cannot live in desecration all the wicked shall be turned to hell the bible says and the nations that forget god psalm 9 17 we have drugs to tear our bodies apart. So many people are hooked on drugs today, doing things to their body, and then doing things to other people because of that. We have promiscuity to tear our families apart. Free sex. Sleep with whoever you want to, whenever you want to. Tearing uh, families apart. We have crime waves to tear our cities apart. Again, if, I, if you do something to me or you diss me in some way, I'm going to get you. If, if uh, uh, I'll, I'll kill you, I'll shoot you, uh, uh, I'll, I'll take from you. If I want what you've got, I'll just come get it. We uh, have secular humanists to tear our schools apart. And the things that they're teaching in school today to our children, how sad it is. So anti-God and anti-God's Word. We have sodomites to tear the moral fabric of our nation apart. We uh, have cults to tear our churches apart. And America's in despair in many ways. And unless God intervenes, there's a day of judgment coming for America. Some people think we need a revolution. And maybe, maybe that's what we do need. I don't know. But could we... Could I say that maybe we need renewal? We need renewal instead of a revolution. 
We need renewal in the things of God. Do you know today that a nation cannot turn to God if the individual men and women do not turn to God? A nation cannot repent if I do not repent. A nation cannot change if I do not change. A nation cannot turn if I do not turn. A nation cannot confess if I, confess if I do not confess. A nation cannot believe if I do not believe. A nation cannot accept if I do not accept. A nation uh, cannot come forward and bow before God if I do not come forward and bow before God. A nation cannot believe God if I do not believe God. A nation cannot be saved if I'm not saved. Our hope lies in our people. That father, that mother, those children, that family, that church, our church. America. The hope of America lies there. God bless America. God save America. As Willard said, God be merciful to America. Where does it start? starts with me. starts with me. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. It starts with me. And so therefore, the message today is it starts with you. We're going to have just a moment of silent prayer. I'm going to be quiet. I want you to pray for America. But I want you to pray that you will be the kind of Christian that God can use to keep our country going. To keep our country strong so that God will not take His hand off of our country. Father, we truly believe that blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. We also believe that blessed is the person whose God is the Lord. May we be that kind of person. That you are our God and our Lord. May we live for you in such a way that you can use us. Lord, to bring strength to America, to bring righteousness to America, to bring revival to America. Thank you for what we've learned and seen here today. Bless it to our hearts and minds. If there's someone here without Christ, I pray that today will be their day of salvation. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.